Like, how stunned can I be? I can be pretty stunned, apparently. <laughs> okay, so... How you guys... Ah, oh, I didn't even clean up. I was... I just removed my lights around to see if I can get a better... picture going on. And I didn't even move my... my notepads around, or my notebooks, or my anything, and... And, oh my goodness, what a pain I am today, trying to start up on time, and blah, uh, things getting stuck on me, and, oh my goodness, mm, is this off, no, yeah, it's off, okay. And oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And I need to... I need to make that so that it stays for a moment, because I'm going to do a video on how to fix mistakes. I don't even know if I'm on screen. <laughs> anyway, okay, where, where are we? Uh, where are we? Where are we? Am I here? I am here. That's where I am. Okay, so not so bad. This is some of the squares I got done from last time, and I made a mistake with this one. I cut the thread of the flower before I put the last flower in, or petal in. So I'm going to do that as a video on how to fix mistakes and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Let's see if I can get this moved out of the way a little bit. There. Now it's just my my old old mouse pad. I need to get a new one, but they all of them are colored and all kinds of stuff, and I just want a plain black one. Um, but anyway, here's some of the squares I got done, and working on, so let's see, uh, let's see, share the link, share the link, um, there. We tweet it. Why can't I think of the, the name of the thingy again? Make you think I'd remember it after a while. Uh, that's what I did type. There. Okay. singing this song. Um, copy link. There we go. Holy cow, why did that take so long? 
I don't know. Because sometimes I'm not smart. Eyes alive, eyes alive. And there. There we go. And you know what? I am. Um, I know I'm moving around a little bit. I'm trying to make it so that it's not showing my lap, but being a little bit closer to where I need the camera to be so that I can Am I here? I I am here. As long as I don't <laughs> stop it. I have to figure out something better first, and so that the camera doesn't wiggle so much. But anyway, this is going to be a lap blanket. Hi, honey. Mwah. How are you doing? And. So that's a square. This one was supposed to join the two up, but no, of course, I had to do it funky way. Anyway, well, well, I'll do up some more squares. I figure it's going to be. You're fixing to cook supper? Mmm, what's for supper? Mmm. I had soup. My color looks pretty good today too, doesn't it? Like I look normally colored. I think I kind of got my... I think I kind of got my um, color fixed or whatever. I'm not sure. We'll figure that out. Refresh. There we go. Hey, Steven, how you doing? You made it. That's awesome. Pretty raw hamburgers. Raw. I do not. Here at Creations by Nadine, we do not endorse the consumption of raw meat. Mm, so there. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna continually debate on the yumminess of of raw meat. I'm glad you can make it, Stephen. These uh, Japanese fairy tales are pretty out there, pretty neat. And um, well, let's see what's going on today. The Goblin of Adakachipper, uh, the Goblin of Adjaka, um, the Goblin of Adakachipper, the Sikhism, the Boar, <laughs> the Monkey and the Boar, and the Happy Hunter and the Skillful Fisher. I could say that one. I'll let the uh, introductions go by the way of the speakers, I think, because me able to say them is a different thing altogether. Nope, you don't have to share, honey. Not in one little bit. <laughs> Not one little bit. So, um. Chapter 11 of Japanese Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Ozaki Chapter 11 The Goblin of Adachigahara Long, long ago there was a large plain called Adachigahara in the province of Mutsu in Japan. This place was said to be haunted by a cannibal goblin who took the form of an old woman. From time to time many travelers disappeared and were never heard of more, and the old women round the charcoal braziers in the evenings, and the girls washing the household rice at the wells in the mornings, whispered dreadful stories of how the missing folk had been lured to the goblin's cottage and devoured, for the goblin lived only on human flesh. No one dared to venture near the haunted spot after sunset, and all those who could avoided it in the daytime, and travelers were warned of the dreaded place. One day as the sun was setting, a priest came to the plain. He was a belated traveler, and his robe showed that he was a Buddhist pilgrim walking from shrine to shrine to pray for some blessing or to crave for forgiveness of sins. He had apparently lost his way, and, as it was late, he met no one who could show him the road or warn him of the haunted spot. He had walked the whole day and was now tired and hungry, and the evenings were chilly, for it was late autumn, and he began to be very anxious to find some house where he could obtain a night's lodging. He found himself lost in the midst of the large plain, and looked about in vain for some sign of human habitation. At last, after wandering about for some hours, he saw a clump of trees in the distance, and through the trees he caught sight of the glimmer of a single ray of light. He exclaimed with joy, Oh, surely that is some cottage where I can get a night's lodging. Keeping the light before his eyes, he dragged his weary, aching feet as quickly as he could towards the spot, and soon came to a miserable-looking little cottage. As he drew near, he saw that it was in a tumble-down condition, the bamboo fence was broken, and weeds and grass pushed their way through the gaps. The paper screens which serve as windows and doors in Japan were full of holes, and the posts of the house were bent with age and seemed scarcely able to support the old thatched roof. The hut was open, and by the light of an old lantern, an old woman sat industriously spinning. The pilgrim called to her across the bamboo fence and said, O oh, Basan! old woman. Good evening. I am a traveler. Please excuse me, but I have lost my way and do not know what to do, for I have nowhere to rest tonight. I beg you to be good enough to let me spend the night under your roof. The old woman, as soon as she heard herself spoken to, stopped spinning, rose from her seat, and approached the intruder. I am very sorry for you. You must indeed be distressed to have lost your way in such a lonely spot so late at night. Unfortunately, I cannot put you up, for I have no bed to offer you, and no accommodation whatsoever for a guest in this poor place. Oh, that does not matter, said the priest. All I want is a shelter under some roof for the night, and if you will be good enough just to let me lie on the kitchen floor, I shall be grateful. I am too tired to walk further tonight so I hope you will not refuse me, otherwise I shall have to sleep out on the cold plain. And in this way he pressed the old woman to let him stay. She seemed very reluctant, but at last she said, Very well, I will let you stay here. I can offer you a very poor welcome only, but come in now and I will make a fire, for the night is cold. The pilgrim was only too glad to do as he was told. He took off his sandals and entered the hut. The old woman then brought some sticks of wood and lit the fire, and bade her guest draw near and warm himself. "'You must be very hungry after your long tramp,' said the old woman. "'I will go and cook some supper for you.' She then went to the kitchen to cook some rice. After the priest had finished his supper, the old woman sat down by the fireplace, and they talked together for a long time. The pilgrim thought to himself that he had been very lucky to come across such a kind, hospitable old woman. At last the wood gave out, and as the fire died slowly down, he began to shiver with cold, just as he had done when he arrived. 
I see you are cold, said the old woman. I will go out and gather some wood, for we have used it all. You must stay and take care of the house while I am gone. No, no, said the pilgrim. Let me go instead, for you are old, and I cannot think of letting you go out to get wood for me this cold night. The old woman shook her head and said, You must stay quietly here, for you are my guest. Then she left him and went out. In a minute she came back and said, You must sit where you are and not move, and whatever happens don't go near or look into the inner room. Now mind what I tell you. If you tell me not to go near the back room, of course I won't, said the priest rather bewildered. The old woman then went out again, and the priest was left alone. The fire had died out, and the only light in the hut was that of a dim lantern. For the first time that night he began to feel that he was in a weird place, and the old woman's words, Whatever you do, don't peep into the back room, aroused his curiosity and his fear. What hidden thing could be in that room that she did not wish him to see? For some time the remembrance of his promise to the old woman kept him still, but at last he could no longer resist his curiosity to peep into the forbidden place. He got up and began to move slowly towards the back room. Then the thought that the old woman would be very angry with him if he disobeyed her made him come back to his place by the fireside. As the minutes went slowly by and the old woman did not return, he began to feel more and more frightened, and to wonder what dreadful secret was in the room behind him. He must find out. She will not know that I have looked unless I tell her. I will just have a peep before she comes back, said the man to himself. With these words he got up on his feet, for he had been sitting all this time in Japanese fashion with his feet under him and stealthily crept towards the forbidden spot. With trembling hands he pushed back the sliding door and looked in. What he saw froze the blood in his veins. The room was full of dead men's bones, and the walls were splashed and the floor was covered with human blood. In one corner skull upon skull rose to the ceiling. In another was a heap of arm bones. In another a heap of leg bones. The sickening smell made him faint. He fell backwards with horror, and for some time lay in a heap with fright on the floor, a pitiful sight. He trembled all over, and his teeth chattered, and he could hardly crawl away from the dreadful spot. "'How horrible!' he cried out. "'What awful den have I come to in my travels! May Buddha help me, or I am lost! Is it possible that that kind old woman is really the cannibal goblin? When she comes back she will show herself in her true character, and eat me up at one mouthful. With these words his strength came back to him, and snatching up his hat and staff, he rushed out of the house as fast as his legs could carry him. Out into the night he ran, his one thought to get as far as he could from the goblin's haunt. He had not gone far when he heard steps behind him, and a voice crying, Stop! Stop! He ran on, redoubling his speed, pretending not to hear. As he ran, he heard the steps behind him come nearer and nearer, and at last he recognized the old woman's voice, which grew louder and louder as she came nearer. Stop! Stop, you wicked man! Why did you look into the forbidden room? The priest quite forgot how tired he was, and his feet flew over the ground faster than ever. Fear gave him strength, for he knew that if the goblin caught him, he would soon be one of her victims. With all his heart, he repeated the prayer to Buddha. Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu. And after him rushed the dreadful old hag, her hair flying in the wind, and her face changing with rage into the demon that she was. In her hand she carried a large blood-stained knife, and she still shrieked after him, Stop! Stop! At last, when the priest felt he could run no more, the dawn broke, and with the darkness of night the goblin vanished and he was safe. The priest now knew that he had met the goblin of Arachigahara, the story of whom he had often heard but never believed to be true. He felt that he owed his wonderful escape to the protection of Buddha,
to whom he had prayed for help. So he took out his rosary, and bowing his head as the sun rose, he said his prayers and made his thanksgiving earnestly. He then set forward for another part of the country, only too glad to leave the haunted plain behind him. End of chapter 11 The Goblin of Adachigahara Recording by Scott Robbins Wow, that was scary. Good thing Hans wasn't here. He would have, uh, we'd have to find some beds for him to hide under. <laughs> okay, the next one. Chapter 12 of Japanese Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Japanese Fairy Tales by Yei Theodora Ozaki Chapter 12 The Sagacious Monkey and the Ball Long, long ago there lived in the province of Shinshin, in Japan, a travelling monkey man who earned his living by taking round a monkey and showing off the animal's tricks. One evening the man came home in a very bad temper, and told his wife to send for the butcher the next morning. The wife was very bewildered, and asked her husband, "'Why do you wish me to send for the butcher?' "'It's no use taking that monkey round any longer. He's too old and forgets his tricks. I beat him with my stick, all I know how, but he won't dance properly. I must now sell him to the butcher, and make what money out of him I can. There is nothing else to be done.' The woman felt very sorry for the poor little animal, and pleaded with her husband to spare the monkey, but her pleading was all in vain. The man was determined to sell him to the butcher. Now the monkey was in the next room, and overheard every word of the conversation. He soon understood that he was to be killed, and he said to himself, "'Barbarous indeed is my master. Here I have served him faithfully for years, and instead of allowing me to end my days comfortably, and in peace, he is going to let me be cut up by the butcher, and my poor body is to be roasted and stewed and eaten? Woe is me! What am I to do? Ah! A bright thought has struck me. There is, I know, a wild boar living in the forest nearby. I have often heard tell of his wisdom. Perhaps if I go to him, and tell him the strait I am in, he will give me his counsel. I will go and try." There was no time to lose. The monkey slipped out of the house and ran as quickly as he could to the forest to find the boar. The boar was at home, and the monkey began his tale of woe at once. "'Good Mr. Boar, I have heard of your excellent wisdom. I am in great trouble. You alone can help me. I have grown old in the service of my master, and because I cannot dance properly now, he intends to sell me to the butcher. What do you advise me to do?' I know how clever you are. The boar was pleased at the flattery, and determined to help the monkey. He thought for a little while, and then said, Hasn't your master a baby? Oh, yes, said the monkey. He has one infant son. Doesn't it lie by the door in the morning, when your mistress begins the work of the day? Well, I will come round early, and when I see my opportunity, I will seize the child and run off with it. "'What then?' said the monkey. "'Why, the mother will be in a tremendous scare, "'and before your master and mistress know what to do, "'you must run after me and rescue the child "'and take it home safely to its parents, "'and you will see that when the butcher comes "'they won't have the heart to sell you.' "'The monkey thanked the boar many times and then went home. "'He did not sleep much that night, as you may imagine, "'for thinking of the morrow. "'His life depended on whether the boar's plan succeeded or not. He was the first up, waiting anxiously for what was to happen. It seemed to him a very long time before his master's wife began to move about and open the shutters to let in the light of day. Then all happened as the boar had planned. The mother placed her child near the porch as usual while she tidied up the house and got her breakfast ready. The child was crooning happily in the morning sunlight, 
dabbing on the mats at the play of light and shadow. Suddenly there was a noise in the porch, and a loud cry from the child. The mother ran out from the kitchen to the spot, only just in time to see the boar disappearing through the gate, with her child in its clutch. She flung out her hands with a loud cry of despair, and rushed into the inner room, where her husband was still sleeping soundly. He sat up slowly and rubbed his eyes, and crossly demanded what his wife was making all that noise about. By the time that the man was alive to what had happened, and they both got outside the gate, the boar had got well away, but they saw the monkey running after the thief as hard as his legs would carry him. Both the man and wife were moved to admiration at the plucky conduct of the sagacious monkey, and their gratitude knew no bounds when the faithful monkey brought the child safely back to their arms. There, said the wife, this is the animal you want to kill. If the monkey hadn't been here, we should have lost our child forever. You are right, wife, for once, said the man as he carried the child into the house. You may send the butcher back when he comes, and now give us all a good breakfast, and the monkey too. When the butcher arrived, he was sent away with an order for some boar's meat for the evening dinner, and the monkey was petted, and lived the rest of his days in peace, nor did his master ever strike him again. End of chapter 12 The Sagacious Monkey and the Boar Read by Gesine in May 2007 Oh, it was the boar they ate. Oh my gosh. Ah, poor boar. Oh. oh well, such is life. Say la vie. And the next story is... I'm not sure. We'll play it. Chapter 13 of Japanese Fairy Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Japanese Fairy Tales by Ye Theodora Ozaki Chapter 13 The Happy Hunter and the Skillful Fisher Long, long ago, Japan was governed by Hohodemi, the fourth Mikoto, or Augustness, in descent from the illustrious Amaterasu, the sun goddess. He was not only as handsome as his ancestress was beautiful, but he was also very strong and brave, and was famous for being the greatest hunter in the land. Because of his matchless skill as a hunter, he was called Yamasachi Hiko, or the Happy Hunter of the Mountains. His elder brother was a very skillful fisher, and, as he far surpassed all rivals in fishing, he was named Uni Sacho Hiko, or the Skillful Fisher of the Sea. The brothers thus led happy lives, thoroughly enjoying their respective occupations, and the days passed quickly and pleasantly while each pursued his own way, the one hunting and the other fishing. One day the happy hunter came to his brother, the skillful fisher, and said, Well, my brother, I see you go to the sea every day with your fishing rod in your hand, and when you return you come laden with fish. And as for me it is my pleasure to take my bow and arrow and to hunt the wild animals up the mountains and down in the valleys. For a long time we have each followed our favorite occupation, so that now we must both be tired you of your fishing, and I of my hunting. Would it not be wise for us to make a change? Will you try hunting in the mountains, and I will go and fish in the sea? The skillful fisher listened in silence to his brother, and for a moment was thoughtful, but at last he answered, Oh, yes, why not? Your idea is not a bad one at all. Give me your bow and arrow, and I will set out at once for the mountains and hunt for game. So the matter was settled by this talk, and the two brothers each started out to try the other's occupation, little dreaming of all that would happen. It was very unwise of them, for the happy hunter knew nothing of fishing, and the skillful fisher, who was bad-tempered, 
knew as much about hunting. The happy hunter took his brother's much-prized fishing hook and rod, and went down to the seashore and sat down on the rocks. He baited his hook, and then threw it into the sea clumsily. He sat and gazed at the little float bobbing up and down in the water, and longed for a good fish to come and be caught. Every time the buoy moved a little, he pulled up his rod, but there was never a fish at the end of it, only the hook and the bait. If he had known how to fish properly, he would have been able to catch plenty of fish, but although he was the greatest hunter in the land, he could not help being the most bungling fisher. The whole day passed in this way while he sat on the rocks, holding the fishing rod and waiting in vain for his luck to turn. At last the day began to darken, and the evening came. Still he had caught not a single fish. Drawing up his line for the last time before going home, he found that he had lost his hook without even knowing when he had dropped it. He now began to feel extremely anxious, for he knew that his brother would be angry at his having lost his hook, for, it being his only one, he valued it above all other things. The happy hunter now set to work to look among the rocks and on the sand for the lost hook, and while he was searching to and fro, his brother, the skillful fisher, arrived on the scene. He had failed to find any game while hunting that day, and was not only in a bad temper, but looked fearfully cross. When he saw the happy hunter searching about on the shore, he knew that something must have gone wrong, so he said at once, "'What are you doing, my brother?' The happy hunter went forward timidly, for he feared his brother's anger, and said, "'Oh, my brother, I have indeed done badly.' "'What is the matter? What have you done?' asked the elder brother impatiently. "'I have lost your precious fishing-hook.' While he was still speaking, his brother stopped him and cried out fiercely, "'Lost my hook! It is just what I expected!' For this reason, when you first proposed your plan of changing over our occupations, I was really against it, but you seemed to wish it so much that I gave in and allowed you to do as you wished. The mistake of our trying unfamiliar tasks is soon seen, and you have done badly. I will not return you your bow and arrow till you have found my hook. Look to it that you find it and return it to me quickly. The happy hunter felt that he was to blame for all that had come to pass and bore his brother's scornful scolding with humility and patience. He hunted everywhere for the hook most diligently, but it was nowhere to be found. He was at last obliged to give up all hope of finding it. He then went home, and in desperation broke his beloved sword into pieces, and made five hundred hooks out of it. He took these to his angry brother and offered them to him, asking his forgiveness and begging him to accept them in the place of the one he had lost for him. It was useless. His brother would not listen to him, much less grant his request. The happy hunter then made another five hundred hooks, and again took them to his brother, beseeching him to pardon him. "'Though you make a million hooks,' said the skillful fisher, shaking his head, "'they are of no use to me. I cannot forgive you unless you bring me back my own hook.' Nothing would appease the anger of the skillful fisher, for he had a bad disposition, and had always hated his brother because of his virtues, and now, with the excuse of the lost fishing-hook, he planned to kill him and to usurp his place as ruler of Japan. The happy hunter knew all this full well, but he could say nothing, for being the younger he owed his elder brother obedience. So he returned to the seashore, and once more began to look for the missing hook. He was much cast down, for he had lost all hope of ever finding his brother's hook now. While he stood on the beach, lost in perplexity and wondering what he had best do next, an old man suddenly appeared carrying a stick in his hand. The happy hunter afterwards remembered that he did not see from whence the old man came. Neither did he know how he was there. He happened to look up and saw the old man coming towards him. You are Hohodemi, the Augustness, sometimes called the Happy Hunter, are you not? said the old man. What are you doing alone in such a place? 
"'Yes, I am he,' answered the unhappy young man. "'Unfortunately, while fishing, I lost my brother's precious fishing-hook. I have hunted this shore all over, but alas, I cannot find it, and I am very troubled, for my brother won't forgive me till I restore it to him. But who are you?' My name is Shiwo Zuchino Okina, and I live nearby on this shore. I am sorry to hear what misfortune has befallen you. You must indeed be anxious. But if I tell you what I think, the hook is nowhere here. It is either at the bottom of the sea or in the body of some fish who has swallowed it. And for this reason, though you spend your whole life in looking for it here, you will never find it. "'Then what can I do?' asked the distressed man. "'You had better go down to Rin-gu and tell Rin-jin, the dragon king of the sea, what your trouble is, and ask him to find the hook for you. I think that would be the best way.' "'Your idea is a splendid one,' said the happy hunter. "'But I fear I cannot get to the sea-king's realm, for I have always heard that it is situated at the bottom of the sea.' "'Oh, there will be no difficulty about your getting there,' said the old man. "'I can soon make something for you to ride on through the sea.' "'Thank you,' said the happy hunter. "'I shall be very grateful to you if you will be so kind.' The old man at once set to work, and soon made a basket and offered it to the happy hunter. He received it with joy, and taking it to the water, mounted it and prepared to start. He bade good-bye to the kind old man who had helped him so much, and told him that he would certainly reward him as soon as he had found his hook and could return to Japan without fear of his brother's anger. The old man pointed out the direction he must take, and told him how to reach the realm of Ringu, and watched him ride out to sea on the basket, which resembled a small boat. The happy hunter made all the haste he could, riding on the basket which had been given him by his friend. His queer boat seemed to go through the water of its own accord, and the distance was much shorter than he expected, for in a few hours he caught sight of the gate and the roof of the Sea King's palace, and what a large place it was, with its numberless sloping roofs and gables, its huge gateways and its grey stone walls. He soon landed, and leaving his basket on the beach, he walked up to the large gateway. The pillars of the gate were made of beautiful red coral, and the gate itself was adorned with glittering gems of all kinds. Large katsura trees overshadowed it. Our hero had often heard of the wonders of the Sea King's palace beneath the sea, but all the stories he had ever heard fell short of the reality which he now saw for the first time. The happy hunter would have liked to enter the gate there and then, but he saw that it was fast closed, and also that there was no one about whom he could ask to open it for him. So he stopped to think what he should do. In the shade of the trees before the gate, he noticed a well full of fresh spring water. Surely someone would come out to draw water from the well sometime, he thought. Then he climbed into the tree overhanging the well and seated himself to rest on one of the branches, and waited for what might happen. Ere long he saw the huge gate swing open, and two beautiful women came out. Now the Mikoto, Augustus, had always heard that Ringu was the realm of the dragon king under the sea, and had naturally supposed that the palace was inhabited by dragons and similar terrible creatures so that when he saw these two lovely princesses, whose beauty would be rare even in the world from which he had just come, he was exceedingly surprised, and wondered what it could mean. He said not a word, however, but silently gazed at them through the foliage of the trees, waiting to see what they would do. He saw that in their hands they carried golden buckets. Slowly and gracefully in their trailing garments they approached the well, standing in the shade of the katsura trees, and were about to draw water, all unknowing of the stranger who was watching them, for the heavy hunter was quite hidden among the branches of the tree where he had posted himself. As the two ladies leaned over the side of the well to let down their golden buckets, 
which they did every day in the year, they saw reflected in the deep still water the face of a handsome youth gazing at them from amidst the branches of the tree in whose shade they stood. Never before had they seen the face of mortal man. They were frightened and drew back quickly with their golden buckets in their hands. Their curiosity, however, soon gave them courage, and they glanced timidly upwards to see the cause of the unusual reflection, and then they beheld the happy hunter sitting in the tree looking down at them with surprise and admiration. They gazed at him face to face, but their tongues were still with wonder and could not find a word to say to him. When the Mikoto saw that he was discovered, he sprang down lightly from the tree and said, I am a traveler, and as I was very thirsty I came to the well in the hopes of quenching my thirst, but I could find no bucket with which to draw the water, so I climbed into the tree much vexed and waited for someone to come. Just at that moment, while I was thirstily and impatiently waiting, you noble ladies appeared, as if in answer to my great need. Therefore I pray you of your mercy, give me some water to drink, for I am a thirsty traveler in a strange land. His dignity and graciousness overruled their timidity, and bowing in silence, they both once more approached the well, and letting down their golden buckets drew up some water and poured it into a jeweled cup and offered it to the stranger. He received it from them with both hands raising it to the height of his forehead in token of high respect and pleasure, and then drank the water quickly for his thirst was great. When he had finished his long draught he set the cup down on the edge of the well, and drawing his short sword he cut off one of the strange curved jewels, Magatama, a necklace of which hung round his neck and fell over his breast. He placed the jewel in the cup and returned it to them, and said, bowing deeply, This is a token of my thanks. The two ladies took the cup, and looking into it to see what he had put inside, for they did not yet know what it was, they gave a start of surprise, for there lay a beautiful gem at the bottom of the cup. No ordinary mortal would give away a jewel so freely. Will you not honor us by telling us who you are? said the elder damsel. Certainly, said the happy hunter. I am Hoho Demi, the fourth Mikoto, also called in Japan the happy hunter. Are you indeed Hoho Temi, the grandson of Amaterasu, the sun goddess? asked the damsel who had spoken first. I am the eldest daughter of Rinjin, the king of the sea, and my name is Princess Tayotama. And, said the younger maiden, who at last found her tongue, I am her sister, the Princess Tamayori. Are you indeed the daughters of Rinjin, the king of the sea? I cannot tell you how glad I am to meet you, said the happy hunter, and without waiting for them to reply, he went on. The other day I went fishing with my brother's hook and dropped it. How, I am sure I can't tell. As my brother prizes his fishing hook above all his other possessions, this is certainly the greatest calamity that could have befallen me. Unless I find it again, I can never hope to win my brother's forgiveness, for he is very angry at what I have done. I have searched for it many, many times, but I cannot find it. Therefore I am much troubled." While I was hunting for the hook in great distress, I met a wise old man, and he told me that the best thing I could do was to come to Ringu and to Rinjin, the dragon king of the sea, and ask him to help me. This kind old man also showed me how to come. Now you know how it is I am here and why. I want to ask Rinjin if he knows where the lost hook is. Will you be so kind as to take me to your father? "'And do you think he will see me?' asked the happy hunter anxiously. Princess Tayotama listened to this long story and then said, "'Not only is it easy for you to see my father, but he will be much pleased to meet you. I am sure he will say that good fortune has befallen him, that so great and noble a man as you, the grandson of Amaterasu, should come down to the bottom of the sea.' And then, turning to her younger sister, she said, 
Do you not think so, Tamayori? Yes, indeed, answered the princess Tamayori in her sweet voice. As you say, we can know no greater honor than to welcome the Mikoto to our home. Then I ask you to be so kind as to lead the way, said the happy hunter. Condescend to enter, Mikoto, Augustness, said both the sisters, and bowing low, they led him through the gate. The younger princess left her sister to take charge of the happy hunter, and going faster than they, she reached the sea king's palace first, and, running quickly to her father's room, she told him of all that had happened to them at the gate, and that her sister was even now bringing the Augustness to him. The dragon king of the sea was much surprised at the news, for it was but seldom, perhaps only once in several hundred years, that the sea king's palace was visited by mortals. Rin Jin at once clapped his hands, and summoned all his courtiers and the servants of the palace, and the chief fish of the sea together, and solemnly told them that the grandson of the sun goddess, Amaterasu, was coming to the palace, and that they must be very ceremonious and polite in serving the august visitor. He then ordered them all to the entrance of the palace to welcome the happy hunter. Rin Jin then dressed himself in his robes of ceremony, and went out to welcome him. In a few moments, the princess Tayotama and the happy hunter reached the entrance, and the sea king and his wife bowed to the ground and thanked him for the honor he did them in coming to see them. The sea king then led the happy hunter to the guest room, and placing him in the uppermost seat, he bowed respectfully before him and said, I am Rin Jin, the Dragon King of the Sea, and this is my wife. Condescend to remember us forever. Are you indeed Rin Jin, the King of the Sea, of whom I have so often heard? answered the happy hunter, saluting his host most ceremoniously. I must apologize for all the trouble I am giving you by my unexpected visit and he bowed again and thanked the sea king. "'You need not thank me,' said Rin Jin. "'It is I who must thank you for coming. Although the sea palace is a poor place, as you see, I shall be highly honored if you will make us a long visit.' There was much gladness between the sea king and the happy hunter, and they sat and talked for a long time. At last the sea king clapped his hands, and then a huge retinue of fishes appeared, all robed in ceremonial garments, and bearing in their fins various trays, on which all kinds of sea delicacies were served. A great feast was now spread before the king and his royal guest. All the fishes in waiting were chosen from amongst the finest fish in the sea, so you can imagine what a wonderful array of sea creatures it was that waited upon the happy hunter that day. All in the palace tried to do their best to please him and to show him that he was a much-honored guest. During the long repast, which lasted for hours, Rin Jin commanded his daughters to play some music, and the two princesses came in and performed on the koto, the Japanese harp, and sang and danced in turns. The time passed so pleasantly that the happy hunter seemed to forget his trouble, and why he had come at all to the sea king's realm, and he gave himself up to the enjoyment of this wonderful place, the land of fairy fishes. Who has ever heard of such a marvelous place? But the Mikoto soon remembered what had brought him to Ringu, and said to his host, Perhaps your daughters have told you, King Rinjin, that I have come here to try and recover my brother's fishing hook which I lost while fishing the other day. May I ask you to be so kind as to inquire of all your subjects if any of them have seen a fishing hook lost in the sea? Certainly, said the obliging sea king. I will immediately summon them all here and ask them. As soon as he had issued his command, the octopus, the cuttlefish, the bonito, the oxtailfish, the eel, the jellyfish, the shrimp, and the plice 
and many other fishes of all kinds came in and sat down before Rin Jin, their king, and arranged themselves and their fins in order. Then the sea king said solemnly, Our visitor, who is sitting before you all, is the august grandson of Amaterasu. His name is Hohodemi, the fourth Augustness, and he is also called the Happy Hunter of the Mountains. While he was fishing the other day upon the shore of Japan, some one robbed him of his brother's fishing hook. He has come all this way down to the bottom of the sea to our kingdom, because he thought that one of you fishes may have taken the hook from him in mischievous play. If any of you have done so, you must immediately return it, or if any of you know who the thief is, you must at once tell us his name and where he is now. All the fishes were taken by surprise when they heard these words, and could say nothing for some time. They sat looking at each other and at the dragon king. At last the cuttlefish came forward and said, I think the Tai, the red bream, must be the thief who has stolen the hook. Where is your proof? asked the king. Since yesterday evening the Tai has not been able to eat anything, and he seems to be suffering from a bad throat. For this reason I think the hook may be in his throat. You had better send for him at once. All the fish agreed to this and said, it is certainly strange that the Tai is the only fish who has not obeyed your summons. Will you send for him and inquire into the matter? Then our innocence will be proved. Yes, said the Sea King, it is strange that the Tai has not come, for he ought to be the first to be here. Send for him at once. Without waiting for the King's order, the cuttlefish had already started for the Tai's dwelling, and he now returned, bringing the Tai with him. He led him before the king. The Tai sat there looking frightened and ill. He certainly was in pain, for his usually red face was pale, and his eyes were nearly closed, and looked but half their usual size. "'Answer, O oh Tai!' cried the sea king. Why did you not come and answer to my summons today? I have been ill since yesterday, answered the Tai. That is why I could not come. Don't say another word, cried out Rin Jin angrily. Your illness is the punishment of the gods for stealing the Mikoto's hook. It is only too true, said the Tai. The hook is still in my throat, and all my efforts to get it out have been useless. I can't eat, and I can scarcely breathe, and each moment I feel that it will choke me, and sometimes it gives me great pain. I had no intention of stealing the Mikoto's hook. I heedlessly snapped at the bait which I saw in the water, and the hook came off and stuck in my throat. So I hope you will pardon me. The cuttlefish now came forward and said to the king, What I said was right. You see the hook still sticks in the Tai's throat. I hope to be able to pull it out in the pretense of the Mikoto, and then we can return it to him safely. Oh, please, make haste and pull it out, cried the Tai pitifully, for he felt the pains in his throat coming on again. I do so want to return the hook to the Mikoto. All right, Tai-san, said his friend the cuttlefish, and then opening the Tai's mouth as wide as he could, and putting one of his feelers down the Tai's throat, he quickly and easily drew the hook out of the sufferer's large mouth. He then washed it and brought it to the king. Rin-jin took the hook from his subject, and then respectfully returned it to the happy hunter, the Mikoto, or Augustness, the fishes called him who was overjoyed at getting back his hook. He thanked Rin Jin many times, his face beaming with gratitude, and said that he owed the happy ending of his quest to the Sea King's wise authority and kindness. 
Rin Jin now desired to punish the tie, but the happy hunter begged him not to do so. Since his lost hook was thus happily recovered, he did not wish to make more trouble for the poor Tai. It was indeed the Tai who had taken the hook, but he had already suffered enough for his fault, if fault it could be called. What had been done was done in heedlessness and not by intention. The happy hunter said he blamed himself. If he understood how to fish properly, he would never have lost his hook and therefore all this trouble had been caused in the first place by his trying to do something which he did not know how to do. So he begged the sea-king to forgive his subject. Who could resist the pleading of so wise and compassionate a judge? Rin Jin forgave his subject at once at the request of his august guest. The Tai was so glad that he shook his fins for joy and he and all the other fish went out from the pretense of their king, praising the virtues of the happy hunter. Now that the hook was found, the happy hunter had nothing to keep him in Ringu, and he was anxious to get back to his own kingdom and to make peace with his angry brother, the skillful fisher. But the sea-king, who had learned to love him and would fain have kept him as a son, begged him not to go so soon but to make the sea-palace his home as long as ever he liked. While the happy hunter was still hesitating, the two lovely princesses, Tayotama and Tamayori, came, and with the sweetest of bows and voices, joined with their father in pressing him to stay, so that without seeming ungracious, he could not say them nay, and was obliged to stay on for some time. Between the sea-realm and the earth there was no difference in the night of time, and the happy hunter found that three years went fleeting quickly by in this delightful land. The years pass swiftly when anyone is truly happy, but though the wonders of that enchanted land seemed to be new every day, and though the sea-king's kindness seemed rather to increase than to grow less with time, the happy hunter grew more and more homesick as the days passed and he could not repress a great anxiety to know what had happened to his home and his country and his brother while he had been away. So at last he went to the sea-king and said, My stay with you here has been most happy, and I am grateful to you for all your kindness to me. But I govern Japan, and, delightful as this place is, I cannot absent myself forever from my country. I must also return the fishing-hook to my brother, and ask his forgiveness for having deprived him of it for so long. I am indeed very sorry to part from you, but this time it cannot be helped. With your gracious permission, I will take my leave today. I hope to make you another visit some day. Please give up the idea of my staying longer now. King Rin Jin was overcome with sorrow at the thought that he must lose his friend, who had made a great diversion in the palace of the sea, and his tears fell fast as he answered, We are indeed very sorry to part with you, Mikoto, for we have enjoyed your stay with us very much. You have been a noble and honored guest, and we have heartily made you welcome. I quite understand that as you govern Japan, you ought to be there and not here, and that it is vain for us to try and keep you longer with us, much as we would like to have you stay. I hope you will not forget us. Strange circumstances have brought us together, and I trust the friendship thus begun between the land and the sea will last and grow stronger than it has ever been before. When the sea-king had finished speaking, he turned to his two daughters and bade them bring him the two tide-jewels of the sea. The two princesses bowed low, rose and glided out of the hall. In a few minutes they returned, each one carrying in her hands a flashing gem which filled the room with light. As the happy hunter looked at them, he wondered what they could be. The sea-king took them from his daughters, and said to his guest, 
these two valuable talismans we have inherited from our ancestors from time immemorial we now give them to you as a parting gift in token of our great affection for you these two gems are called the nanjiu and the kanjiu the happy hunter bowed low to the ground and said i can never thank you enough for all your kindness to me and will you add one more favor to the rest and tell me what these jewels are and what i am to do with them the nanjiu answered the sea king is also called the jewel of the flood tide and whoever holds it in his possession can command the sea to roll in and flood the land at any time that he wills the kanjiu is also called the jewel of the ebbing tide and this gem controls the sea and the waves thereof and will cause even a tidal wave to recede then rinjin showed his friend how to use the talismans one by one and handed them to him the happy hunter was very glad to have these two wonderful gems the jewel of the flood tide and the jewel of the ebbing tide to take back with him for he felt that they would preserve him in case of danger from enemies at any time after thanking his host again and again he prepared to depart the sea king and the two princesses tayotama and tamayori and all the inmates of the palace came out to say good-bye and before the sound of the last farewell had died away the happy hunter passed out from under the gateway past the well of happy memory standing in the shade of the great katsura trees on his way to the beach here he found instead of the queer basket on which he had come to the realm of ringu a large crocodile waited for him never had he seen such a huge creature it measured eight fathoms in length from the tip of its tail to the end of its long mouth the sea king had ordered the monster to carry the happy hunter back to japan like the wonderful basket which siro zuchino okina had made it could travel faster than any steamboat and in this strange way riding on the back of a crocodile the happy hunter returned to his own land as soon as the crocodile landed him the happy hunter hastened to tell the skillful fisher of his safe return he then gave him back the fishing hook which had been found in the mouth of the tai and which had been the cause of so much trouble between them he earnestly begged his brother's forgiveness telling him all that had happened to him in the sea king's palace and what wonderful adventures had led to the finding of the hook now the skilful fisher had used the lost hook as an excuse for driving his brother out of the country when his brother had left him that day three years ago and had not returned he had been very glad in his evil heart and had at once usurped his brother's place as a ruler of the land and had become powerful and rich now in the midst of enjoying what did not belong to him and hoping that his brother might never return to claim his rights quite unexpectedly there stood the happy hunter before him the skilful fisher feigned forgiveness for he could make no more excuses for sending his brother away again but in his heart he was very angry and hated his brother more and more till at last he could no longer bear the sight of him day after day and planned and watched for an opportunity to kill him one day when the happy hunter was walking in the rice fields his brother followed him with a dagger the happy hunter knew that his brother was following him to kill him and he felt that now in this hour of great danger was the time to use the jewels of the flow and ebb of the tide and prove whether what the sea king had told him was true or not so he took out the jewel of the flood tide from the bosom of his dress and raised it to his forehead instantly over the fields and over the farms the sea came rolling in wave upon wave till it reached the spot where his brother was standing the skilful fisher stood amazed and terrified to see what was happening in another minute he was struggling in the water and calling on his brother to save him from drowning 
the happy hunter had a kind heart and could not bear the sight of his brother's distress he at once put back the jewel of the flood tide and took out the jewel of the ebb tide no sooner did he hold it up as high as his forehead than the sea ran back and back and ere long the tossing rolling floods had vanished and the farms and fields and dry land appeared as before the skillful fisher was very frightened at the peril of death in which he had stood and was greatly impressed by the wonderful things he had seen his brother do he learned now that he was making a fatal mistake to set himself against his brother younger than he thought he was for he now had become so powerful that the sea would flow in and the tide ebb at his word of command so he humbled himself before the happy hunter and asked him to forgive him all the wrong he had done him the skillful fisher promised to restore his brother to his rights and also swore that though the happy hunter was the younger brother and owed him allegiance by right of birth that he the skillful fisher would exalt him as his superior and bow before him as lord of all japan then the happy hunter said that he would forgive his brother if he would throw into the receding tide all his evil ways the skillful fisher promised and there was peace between the two brothers from this time he kept his word and became a good man and a kind brother the happy hunter now ruled his kingdom without being disturbed by family strife and there was peace in japan for a long long time above all the treasures in his house he prized the wonderful jewels of the flow and ebb of the tide which had been given him by rin jin the dragon king of the sea this is the congratulatory ending of the happy hunter and the skillful fisher End of chapter 13 The Happy Hunter and the Skillful Fisher Recording by Scott Robbins Wow, I thought he was going to get eat it or something. So that's pretty good. This is, that turned out nicer than a couple of the other stories. Oops, I'm wiggling. Um... Thanks for joining me, guys. I uh, appreciate it. Excuse me. My gosh. Um, we have... Oh, we still got... Nine stories left in the book. Um, so, if you uh, join me on Sunday, if you guys have time, I would appreciate it. Um... That was, of course it was, are you, are you surprised, BBA, like, really, <laughs> thanks for coming by, <laughs> I try to pick, uh, stories from LibriVox, and, uh, because I don't have to deal with copyright issues with that, they're public domain, so if you guys, find a story you want that I haven't done before let me know and we'll, we'll do her up all the Japanese stories have been quite interesting I, I suggest listening to them the rest of them you know I, I got some videos just so you know but um, yeah they're pretty good stories I, I like them Wonder Lady loves them so that's awesome and um yeah uh next next week we'll do the story of the old man who made weathered trees on not next week on sunday um the story of the old man who made weathered trees to flower the jellyfish and the monkey and the quarrel of the monkey and the crab and then there's uh six more after that in the meantime if anybody wants to request something uh, go ahead because this is just separate short stories so you know we can pop in and out of the middle of this one no problem so uh, but thanks for coming I really appreciate it remember to like subscribe and all that kind of fun stuff and um, 
We'll talk to you guys later. Love yous. Bye. Bye. Oh, where's the button? Where's the button? See ya, honey. Mwah. <laughs>